Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, the transition to uh, digital communications. Uh, last semester we talked about uh, analog communications and this time around we are going to talk about digital communications. The block diagram of uh, the transmission system that involves uh, information coming from a source uh, passing through what we call uh, the transmission medium in what we call the channel and then finally to the uh, user of information that we call the, the sync it is given here in our figure 1.1 and basically what happens is that if you have the information that's coming from the source if it is digital then it goes straight to the, the section that is called the uh, waveform encoder while if it happens to pass uh, to, to be of analog uh, nature then it would have to uh, to be processed before it can go to the waveform encoder and the, the, the processing involves three stages that is um, sampling quantization and encoding of course if the information is from uh, uh, in the form of a text then the text goes straight to the to the code now what we want to talk about uh, right now is this process of sampling quantization and coding that is the transition to digital communications where you take an analog signal and you render it in digital form so that uh, it's in a sequence of binary digits that can be given to the waveform encoder. Uh, but briefly, um, in, in, there are other components in this transmission chain, and it's the after the waveform encoder, which basically ensures that what is being transmitted is in the form that can be um, acceptable eventually to the to, to the channel. The transmitter basically adds some um, carrier information uh, to ensure that uh, the the frequencies are, are lined up. On the other side, you have the receiver and then the waveform decoder and uh, the, whatever does the reverse what was done in the transmitter. So we have a description here of the various components um, and I think I'm just going to be holding them on there for, for a second or two so that you can read what, uh, what it says about that basically we are preparing what we are going to transmit in so that it can fit uh, it can be carried into the transmission medium um, the, we'll talk about here about uh, various forms of sampling the one that uh, uh, is easiest to talk about is the so-called ideal sampling or impulse sampling where we basically, basically assume that the, the message to be sampled or the signal to be sampled uh, is a time function represented by m of t and we are just multiplying that by some switching uh, signal this is a, a sequence of delta functions that are multiplying the incoming signal to produce the sampled uh, waveform so this is mathematically this is the representation or the diagrammat diagrammatically this is the representation and mathematically this is the for a sum of weighted shifted impulses uh, we are using the, the sum going from minus infinity to plus infinity for mathematical convenience but in real life of course uh, you want to go to, to infinity because you know we don't have that luxury all right the sampling frequency is um, f sub s cycles per second the, the time between the samples is ts what we want to do uh, shortly is to <coughs> come up with uh, some restriction on the sampling frequency because you'd like to to answer the question is there a limit as to how slow you can sample and still be able to uh, to get what you want out of the system in other words, their minimum sampling um, frequency. And the answer is yes, that there is some minimum that we are going to establish as we go along. So, if we take it that uh, our M of T looks like what is shown here, and uh, 
its spectron, that is the Fourier transform of the uh, time waveform, has got a magnitude spectrum that looks like this, going from minus w hertz to plus w hertz. And then when you uh, do the multiplication by the, the stream of, uh, of delta functions, what you end up getting will be what is shown below here. You know, the string of delta functions multiplying the string of delta functions here multiplying the, the m of t that's on top here will produce this now string that is uh, down here. In other words, the delta functions have been um, modulated, if you will, by the, the time function, that uh, time signal that, that, that you are sampling. And it turns out, we have not we have not shown it yet, it turns out that the spectrum, if you take the frequency, the Fourier transform on the sample signal, you will find that the spectrum is a, is a sequence of shifted copies of the original spectrum, weighted by uh, one of our tiers. We'll, we'll show that shortly. So the sampling produces replication of, uh, of the, the spectrum. And so what we want to do is to make sure that uh, the spacing in the frequency domain of the replicated copies is such that there's no overlap. Because if there's no overlap, then a low-pass filter can be used to, to select the, the, the central copy, which is basically looking like the original. You can see in this diagram that the central copy looks like the the original that we had and so if, if by a low pass filter you can select it then you have the, the original signal back all right so what what is happening the sample signal m sub s of t is the product of m of t multiplied with the by the sampling signal and in the frequency domain you you use the idea that when you multiply things in the time domain, in the frequency domain, you have a convolution. So with this M sub S, which is the spectrum of the sampled signal, is M sub F convolved with a stream of impulses. Uh, it turns out again that uh, the stream of impulses in the time domain corresponds to a stream of impulses in the frequency domain um, divided by 1 over Ts. I think for this, I'll refer you to the derivation of this result that we that, that is in this same notes in the part that is dealing with the, the Fourier transform of uh, a delta, uh, an impulse stream. You find that uh, if you have a delta stream in time, uh, that corresponds to a delta stream, uh, an impulse stream in frequency where the, you just divide by one over Ts, and then where in the time domain you have Ts here, you will to have Fs. You, know, you have T in the time domain, you have F. That is derived in the notes very well, so you can go back and uh, and, and, and see it. So the, the convolution uh, is a linear operation, and therefore you can move this convolution inside. And when you convolve M of F with the, with the delta function, then you get uh, uh, this result here, 1 over t is the sum of the shifted copies of the, the, the original spectrum. The original spectrum was n of f, this one. And now you're having a string of shifted copies of the same. Okay, so if the bandwidth of m of t is limited to w hat, then, uh, you can, then you can see that the uh, the M of T can be recovered from M S of T by an ideal low pass filter. This sum that we have here is basically uh, represented in, in, in diagrammatic form by this replication of the spectral copies. And we are saying that you can recover M S of T by picking the guy in the middle. That is the, uh, the copy that is sitting at, at, at zero hertz. Okay, so we, if if f sub uh, if the sampling frequency is less than two uh, w, that means that is under sampling, then the copies of m of f will overlap, and it is not possible to recover m of t by filtering. 
So if you have a problem, the problem is called aliasing. So you will need the sampling frequency to be larger than twice the highest frequency in the signal so that um, the, uh, by low pass filtering, we can get our signal back. Of course, you can be asking the question, why sample it? And then immediately after sampling, you try to get the signal back. Uh, the reason is that, is that uh, we are not trying to get the signal back immediately. We're basically saying that if it is possible to get the signal back from its samples, then it means that uh, there is no uh, uh, corruption among the, the samples, and therefore the copies that we get are good. And so we can carry out our signal processing with the samples. And then when we try now eventually to get uh, uh, the results back into the time domain, what we get will be legitimate results. So the, our attempt to get the signal back from its samples is just to ensure for us that what we have in terms of sample, the samples are good and we can use them for processing. Okay, we have uh, uh, some example here. Uh, if you try to take uh, uh, some samples of, of, of a sine wave, uh, sort of, 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 of a signal here, and what happens is that uh, you you can think of recovering the signal uh, back, and uh, what what that basically means that you are having uh, the green functions that we are using, and if you look at uh, the, the the values with the green functions uh, at, the, at the sampling instance, um, they are just the values of the, of the samples. And the, the samples are, are in red. Uh, this, this text that are in red, those are the sample values. And uh, the reconstruction is being done by taking each sample value and multiplying by a green uh, reconstruction function. And so the sum of all those greens weighted by the by the reds, it will give us the uh, the blue signal, which is the same as the, 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 the original. We're just illustrating the process of reconstruction. And how you do it mathematically is basically uh, via what we have uh, in in here. We are constructing M of T from its uh, from its samples. So what we are doing is um, we are taking the uh, saying the m of t is supposed to be the inverse Fourier transform of m of f and it's supposed to be in, in m of f multiplied by this exponential and integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity and so if you uh, you have the m of f in the frequency domain Represented as given here, um, then what what happens that you can show from this these steps that the result is the same as taking the samples of m of m of t at uh, taking the t s multiplied by this sequence of uh, shifted um, sync functions. Um, this integral going from minus w to plus w here gives us the sync the sync function that you can actually uh, demonstrate again the sync function is in these notes in the part where we talk about elementary um, functions so you can get elementary signals so you can get there the description of the sync function and uh, so you can you know, pause here and go back to the, to the notes where the sync functions this describe and, and, and so on. But the result is that you have the m, uh, the time function evaluated at time instants given by n over 2w, and those are the, the weights that are multiplying the shifted uh, sync, sync function, copies of the sync function, to give you back the m of t. This process where you're getting m of t from the sync function is, is given this diagram here where we have the same functions in green and the, the weights are in, in red and then the result is this, this in blue.
that mathematically that's what is uh, that's what is happening so what we have just come up with the idea that the sampling um, frequency has got to be at least twice the highest frequency in the signal that's the so-called sampling theorem what some what people sometimes call the Nyquist sampling uh, theorem and the if you can say that uh, you have a band limited uh, signal uh, this uh, uh, signal that has got no frequency components above w hertz then it is completely described by the values of the signal at periodic time instants that are separated by at most 1 over 2 w uh, time the time interval between the samples is 1 over 2 w or if you like the sampling frequency fs is 2 w and that this some this uh, fs equals 2 w is called the Nyquist rate and it's reciprocal as the Nyquist interval so if you have ideal sampling um, which we have described here we will just say that it is good for uh, mathematical description of the sampling process but in, in real life it's difficult to achieve because it's hard to get an impulse but an impulse is a signal that has got no width it turns on at an instant of time and it switches off before the at that same instant of time um, so it's difficult to get it in real, in real life but uh, what what we might have to do is to think about uh, uh, what is what is called natural sampling natural sampling is uh, in, the, in the case where you say since uh, ideal sampling which requires delta functions it's impossible because it's difficult to realize a delta function we'll have something uh, that allows a finite width. The pulses that we use for sampling have got a finite width. So that instead of having delta functions, you have very narrow um, pulses, like as we have in this diagram here. Then the result is uh, that uh, what you end up having is that the same pulses uh, that you have here will be mul multiplied by the, the, the time function or the time signal and you're going to get those same pulses but now with their amplitudes are going up and down depending on the value of the signal but the spectrum now is not as nice as uh, as was uh, uh, before the, the spectrum is is now uh, multiplied by some some quantity they're not all the same the spectral copies are such that the one at zero is multiplied by uh, some this this envelope here this envelope that we have in dotted form here is give us the values that are multiplying the spectral components so the spectral component at zero is multiplied by uh, you can say by one and then the others on the side are slightly squashed but it's okay because what is happening is that uh, the this, the, the whole spectrum um, in this case is multiplied by one one number uh, and so uh, if if, uh, if if the the width is small enough if the width if this w is small enough then the there's no distortion in the spectral component and therefore it is possible um, by low pass filtering to get back the signal slightly uh, distorted we can look at this uh, dotted uh, line here and you can see it goes up and down but around uh, zero here it's not it's almost flat and therefore uh, we can say that there is no not much distortion on the, uh, the component that we are trying to get back let's look at the mathematics now um, if you're trying to get the signal constru reconstruction from natural sampling, then what we are going to say is that uh, the, the periodic pulse train that we are using to, uh, to multiply the time function, P sub T, is, has got its components, the dn, and multiplying the, the complex exponentials in the complex Fourier series. And you can show that uh, 
d sub n is given by tau over ds multiplying sinc n tau over ds and then scaled by some exponential uh, again you can look at the complex Fourier series uh, back in the, in, the, in the notes and you'll find um, that the result the sample waveform and its Fourier transforms are given as m sub s is m of t multiplying um, this thing this dn exponential 2 pi uh, 2 pi j nfts and okay, so nfst and so what is happening is that um, the, the spectrum of the sample signal is dn uh, because when you when you take this the spectrum it means you're taking the Fourier transform so taking the Fourier transform of n of t multiplied by a complex exponential but that just give, that just gives you gives you the m of f capital m of f shifted by um, n times fs so what this is saying is that uh, there is a, a dn that is multiplying the m with the shifted copy so the original signal m of t can be reconstructed using a low pass filter as long as the Nyquist criterion is satisfied so the what we're saying then is that uh, the uh, the natural sampling, which is, uh, is easier to, to, to get, and so we can uh, use it in order to get for us the, the sample signal in some uh, that is more practical. You can also have flat top sampling, uh, which, is, uh, which is another form of sampling. A flat top sampling, which is the most popular and involves two sampling operations. Sample and hold. You may have met sample and hold. Uh, you basically have a, a, a switch and uh, and some op amp and a capacitor. So the capacitor charges the sample value, and and then before you hold until the next signal comes back, and and, and so on. So it's a, it's a lot easier to, to, to do. What to, what you end up doing is that uh, we have yeah, m of t and the sample. This is now the representation. You represent this by a sequence of delta functions. For mathematical convenience, we're doing it that way, and then you pass the result through uh, a holding operation, which has got uh, an impulse response, which is going on for dilution tau. Practically, you implement this by using uh, some some switch and the capacitor and an op amp. So the result is m sub s of t is m t s uh, multiplying shifted copies of this h. And the result then is uh, uh, if you want to get so we can write the this m s of t as m of t uh, multiplying the delta the shifted delta functions convolve the h of t and now what what ends up uh, happening is that if you take the Fourier transform then uh, the time function becomes a, a frequency function or, or a spectrum and the Fourier transform of of this the one in brackets multiply with the Fourier transform of h so um, the one in the curly brackets gives us uh, the shifted copies of m of f and the one that is outside here h of t becomes h of f and of course there is a one over ts that comes with, uh, uh, with the shifted copies of the delta functions and so the result again is uh, what is it I think I didn't uh, I didn't write it down. Um, it's tau sinc f f tau exponential. That's for h. And oh, here the m sub s of t of f. The m sub s of f is given by this. There's an h of s uh, h of f multiplied by one over t s, 
meant that multiplies the shifted copies of the spectral uh, the spectrum. Now here is where there's a bigger problem than than before, in that now what is multiplying the shifted copies depends on the frequency. The the edge is multiplying everything. In the case of uh, the um, the natural sampling where we had the pulses, the spectrum was multiplied by a dn, which each copy was multiplied, you can see here. So for example, the one at zero was multiplied by d0, everything was multiplied by d0. The multiplier did not depend on frequency. And so it was easy to get the original signal back, uh, to get the original signal back just by no pass filter. While here, um, the edge is multiplying everything and the value of h depends on the point uh, at, at which you are you are looking in the spectral uh, domain and so what happens is that every component is is warped by this uh, by, the, by this edge so you may need because if the edge is as shown here in, uh, then, for example, you look at the copy at uh, at zero, the one that you want, it's going to be multiplied by this uh, by this curve. And now you need to to, uh, to say that if the W is small enough, then the distortion is not that uh, is not that much, and so you can uh, you can more or less ignore it. But if not, you may have to get some um, equalizer that. Um, has got a, a frequency uh, response that is one over one over h. Okay, because there's a ts there, so we have to put ts over over h. So the result is uh, is one. In other words, uh, you'd have to have the reconstruction filter, um, which is a low pass filter, and then you pass that through an equalizer to get the NFT back. So apart so uh, apart from requiring um, that extra bit of equalization, it is something that is practical, as opposed to the natural, to the um, impulse sampling or ideal sampling, which is not, uh, which, which is not possible. Okay, so we, we said before that uh, the pulse modulation, you can have uh, basically three, supposed to be three forms. Um, you can deal with the with phase, you can deal with the frequency, and you can deal with amplitude. So now, um, we are going to introduce a little bit more here, where we are now going to talk about uh, the pulse amplitude modulation, and then this pulse width modulation, which is used to control the speeds of motors, and pulse position modulation, which can be, can be used in uh, in time division multiplexing, um, and and then the pulse code modulation, which uh, we'll talk about at length uh, in in this in these notes. So basically, what we have are uh, three main things. We've left uh, left out uh, the okay. We have pulse amplitude modulation with modulation and pulse position modulation for um, analog modulation and then if you want to do digital pulse modulation, pulse code modulation, differential PCM and delta modulation. The pulse width modulation alternative uh, you can have pulse length modulation or pulse duration modulation and basically what, what that does is uh, that um, the the width of the pulse depends on the amplitude. So if you look at this diagram here, this we're talking about pulse width modulation. Um, you you look at the signaling in the the bit duration or the pulse duration. The pulse duration is the same. In other words, uh, the duration of the signaling interval is the same in all in all these and the timing pulses are given here but you want to do pulse width modulation then we're going to look at the the value of the signal at uh, uh, let's say the 
the sampling instant. So the sampling instant, the value is, is, is this, this value here. And so the width is whatever and that corresponds to. And then when you take this value here, the peak, the signal is wider. And you take uh, the next one, it's, it's wider still and wider still. And then it's, it begins to go down and it begins to get, to get wider. So the value of the pulse, uh, the value of the signal uh, gives you the width of the pulse and you have pulse width modulation. For pulse position modulation, the position within the signal in interval away from the, the left edge is proportional to the, to the value of the, of the signal. So when the signal is, is high, then you are far to the right and when the signal is low, then you are, then you are far to the, to, to, to the left, and so on. So, for example, when you're almost zero, um, so when you're negative, you have a negative value here, and you're almost at the edge there, and so on. So, okay. those are the, the two results. Now, if you go to um, how you can generate those, I think I'll leave the diagram there. Uh, we won't require the sort of uh, uh, generator, which goes to a comparator. And the comparator, of course, is going to be firing um, when the, the inputs uh, happen to, to differ in value and, and, and so on. And out of that, now you look at, if you want to get the pulse width uh, modulation, then what happens is that uh, you, you take the, the, the time when this uh, ramp is going up and when the ramp crosses the signal in question then you look at the time from the beginning to that point that gives you the width the time from the beginning to that point that gives you the width and so on while the pulse position relation is just starting from the point where the, the two are equal so you can generate the pulse width modulation and pulse position modulation by using the same uh, uh, the same diagram, basically. So uh, there's some more uh, descriptions in the, in the table here. And I think we, we want to represent uh, the pulse time modulated signals. Um, here, pulse time modulated signal uh, is represented by, uh, by a sum of, uh, of shifted copies of an original, uh, an original pulse. So we're, we're assuming that the pulse that we're dealing with is, is zero for negative, for negative time and, and, and zero for time larger than, than, than Ts, uh, then we represent it uh, this way. Now, I know that when I'm talking like this, that probably you might be saying that uh, uh, this is too much. Uh, we, I, I'm giving an overview, generally. So uh, when it comes to things for the exams, I'll be more specific, and you'll be able to to, to get what is needed for um, for exams, but you need this for your understanding. So you can do the demodulation of pulse position mod uh, modulated signals, and we can also have a, a pulse amplitude modulation. Again, we just described briefly, briefly what is happening. This is the case where the amplitude is proportional, the amplitude of the pulse is proportional to the value of the signal. So when the signal is high, the pulse has got a high amplitude, and when the signal is low, uh, low and negative, the pulse is, has got a big amplitude, but in the negative direction, and so forth. So the pulse amplitude when the signal is this thing in purple, and it tends to follow the, the, the red signal, which is the analog signal that we are trying to, uh, to, to sample. Um, again, we turn to present pulse amplitude when the signal. Um, there we have the pulses and the dotted signal is the analog signal and you can see that the amplitudes tend to follow and follow each other. The representation is the values of the analog signal at sample times 
multiplying with this shifted copies of uh, edge. Um, edge is the, the part that we're using. Okay, so I um, think uh, we're talking about aperture effects. In other words, the pulse that we're using because it's of finite duration um, in frequency is going to spill uh, the, the, the spill out so that uh, we need uh, equalization, as we already said before. In other words, you need to have an equalizer. We just got uh, an, um, an amplitude in frequency that is like one of our HVS. And we saw that already. So you need to have uh, the palm signal, palms, uh, pulse amplitude modulated signal, the uh, reconstruction filter, and you need an equalizer. All right. So what we are going to talk about, not now, uh, but uh, is the transition from analog to digital communi communications. And uh, that is uh, a, a lecture that I'm going to tape next time. And, uh, and give to you. So for now, if you want to, you can read this section of the notes so that when you receive uh, uh, the recording, you will be in a better position to follow because I'll tend to go a bit faster since there's a lot of material that we have to, to cover. But for now, I'll end it, uh, I'll end it there and uh, we'll, we'll pause.